to New Beginnings Christian Center. I'm getting more and more excited. We're two Sundays away from Pentecost. And uh, that's why I, I've been preaching certain messages to prepare us. And I believe you're going to really enjoy today. Uh, we're going to a new level, guys. And uh, that's what this is all about, going to a new level. And today's sermon is all about receiving heavenly boundaries. Uh, so I want to get right into this. So uh, let's uh, look at our scripture verses that we've been using over the last few weeks. This is part three. Let's look at the book of Isaiah and turn to Isaiah 42, 9, and then uh, Isaiah 43, 19. So 43, 19, and 42, 9. Here we go with Isaiah 42, 9, the New King James Version. Here we go. Behold, the former things have come to pass. And new things I declare, before they spring forth, I'll tell you of them. All right, let's move on to Isaiah 43, 19. Come on, our number two verse. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness. I like that. And rivers in the desert. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your words, your promises. They're yes and amen. And uh, they're encouraging words, words to build us up, lift us up, and, uh, and lead us on a path to the new things that you're going to do. And uh, we have said this, somebody say amen. We have said this time and time again, since we began this series in the beginning of the month, that God wants to do extraordinary things through ordinary people. And that's you and me. That's us. And uh, God wants to work through it. He's a good God. And uh, God is a God of action. He's always doing something. He's always up. God is always up to something. Yeah. Yeah. We may be doing nothing, but God's always up to something. Uh, come on now. And like I said, you know, when we combine these two texts, I came up with this little thing. Hey, uh, God's saying to us, if I paraphrase, hey, I I'm, I'm going to do something new. But before it springs up, I'm going to give you a heads up. So, like I said, we're two Sundays away from Pentecost 2020, and I don't know about you, but I'm very excited. Um, thousands of churches are going to open on Pentecost Sunday. I'm just going to leave that there. But we are determined that Pentecost is that important that we will open on the 31st. Now, we will follow CDC guidelines of separation and, and uh, all this. We have hand sanitized. We have everything in place to keep you safe. So I don't want you to worry. But we're going to a new level and we got to prepare ourselves. We're talking about receiving heavenly boundaries today. Now, have you ever gone to a bowling alley during a special event? Uh, you know, I, even when I used to bring my children bowling, Children's bowling was a lot of fun. What they did, they put up gutter guards. This way the balls would not go into the gutter so that the kids had a, an even chance of at least hitting one pin. And uh, they just sometimes just roll the ball. And at one time when we took our children, they had like this, it looked like a slide. And, and you put the ball at the top of it for them and they pushed it. And it would roll down this slide and then head down the alley. Now for us adults, uh, I loved it when they had special games and they put up the gutter gods because we just wouldn't go in the gutter. Well, in a sense, God has set up some boundaries for us so that we don't wind up in the gutter. And there's three areas that I want to touch on today. I want to touch on the word. I want to touch on our worship and then our walk. And let's take a look at what, uh, what God does to set up these heavenly boundaries. Um, yeah. Yeah. I like that uh, God has set up these boundaries. And if we choose to use, somebody say choose to use. Yeah, there you go. If we choose to use what God has provided for us, you know, uh, we'll never fall. We'll never stumble. We'll never fail. I want to read you something from the Passion Translation before I begin. It's in 2 Peter 1.10. And the word of God says, for this reason, beloved ones, be eager to confirm and validate that God has invited you to salvation and claimed you as his own. And if you do these things, you will never stumble. Never. Come on, I don't know about you, but that makes me happy. So let's get started here today. 
Let's talk about the word, the heavenly boundaries when it comes to the word. I want us to go to James chapter 1. I want to read verses 21 through 25. James chapter 1, 21 through 25. I'll give you a second to get there. Okay, here we go. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks in the perfect law, somebody say perfect law. I'm going to come back to that. The perfect law of liberty, somebody say freedom, come on, and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Come on, somebody. I love that word. The perfect law of liberty that, uh, that James is talking about here is found in Romans chapter 8. In fact, it's Romans 8, 2. And the Romans 8, 2 talks about the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ is the most powerful law in the universe. It overtakes every law in creation. It is the most powerful law. And the scripture says that we are free. What are we free to do is to serve. What are we free from? Bondage to sin. Come on, somebody. And it also goes on to say, and we'll be blessed. I want to say something to you today that it is in the doing that the blessings are released. As you do, God releases blessings. He just pours them out. But we have to get involved. We have to do some doing. In James 2, 14 through 17, it's the scripture all about faith. And it tells us that faith without works is dead. Let me read this to you. It says, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Have you ever been there? Ah, oh, man, you know what? If, if you don't want to hear a story, do not ask somebody how you're doing. Uh, you know, as a New Yorker, we say it all the time, hey, how you doing, you know? But when, if you're going to ask that question, you got to open up your ears and listen. And then you can't just be a hearer, you got to be a doer. If you're truly a man or woman of God, and, and when you say, how you doing, and somebody tells you, you know what, I ain't doing so good, you know? I got this, I got that, I got... And if you have the wherewithal to help them, you're, you are like obligated to do something about their situation. I want to leave that right there. The word of God is living and powerful. It is alive and in motion and designed to motivate us. I like what Hebrews 4.12 says about the word. He said, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Come on, somebody. The word is amazing. The true word of God will poke at your mind, it'll poke at your will, and it'll poke at your emotions. And it's going to cause you to search your hearts to discern what God's intended purpose for you is. Come on. I like what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15. He says to young Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved of God. A worker. Somebody say worker. There you go. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Ah, here it is. A worker. Anyone who is actively serving God. 
will never struggle with the feelings of shame for not doing what the Lord is asking of them. Somebody say amen. So the heavenly boundaries for the word are hearers and doers. Hearers and doers. If you, if you eliminate one during your walk, you know, the enemy wants to knock you off your path, the intended path that God has for you. That's why God has these gutter gods for you. So being a hearer and a doer, when you abide in them, when you keep within those boundaries that God has established, you won't stumble, you won't fall, and the enemy will fail as it attempts to try and stop you from fulfilling the purpose God has for you. Let's take a look at our worship. John 4, 19 through 24. In John chapter 4, there's a story about Jesus meeting the woman at the well. What I love about this story is that Jesus sends the disciples on to go get something to eat. He tells them, you know what, I'm really not hungry. I'm just going to sit here at the well. You just go ahead and you go get us something to eat. See, because Jesus knew there was, a, there was an appointed time. And uh, he couldn't have them nearby to mess things up. I, I'm, just, I'm just getting ahead of myself here a little bit. But let me read you the story in John chapter 4, 19 through 24. Here comes the woman. And the woman said to him, sir... I perceive that you are a prophet, and our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, now listen carefully how Jesus responds, woman, believe me. I can see him saying, believe me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, ever, you ever get to somebody like that? You say, hey, believe me. I, I, I got the straight stuff on this. I got the scoop, you know. And he says, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. And, and look at this. He says to her, you worship what you do not know. I'll come back to that. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming. Huh. And he speaks a prophetic word and then a forth telling word. He says, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the father in spirit and truth. For the father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship with him or worship him must worship in spirit and truth. In spirit and truth. You already see where this is going, right? See, here's the problem. I was listening to Tim Sheets the other day. Uh, actually, you know, it, it, it wasn't, it was, it was, uh, it was uh, Chuck Pierce. And Chuck Pierce said this, the problem that we have in churches today and with Christians is some worship God in the spirit and some worship God in truth. The problem is we need to do both. Now, if you look at the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritans may have been worshiping in the spirit of their forefathers, but it was obviously that they were living in the flesh. I mean, Jesus told her all the things about her life and how many husbands she's had and the fact that she's living out of wedlock right now with some guy. Uh, it goes on and on. But when she met the truth, with a capital T, when she met Jesus, the truth, she found her identity and her life was never the same again. She left behind, in fact, what she came for and ran back to share what she had found. Oh, when I see this, when I hear this, I think about the, the worker in the field who discovered a treasure. And what he did is he, he covered it back up and he, he went out and sold everything he had <laughs> because this priceless treasure, he wanted to own that field so that treasure would be his. I, I want to move on. I don't want to spend too much time with this. But she says this in John 4, 25 through 30. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Now get ready for this now. Get ready. Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, there are certain phrases and, and quotes in the Bible that I believe when, when Jesus, you know, sometimes Jesus is just talking 
And then there are times when he speaks. And I believe at the moment he spoke those words to her, something flashed and transformed her life forever. She will never be the same again. And it reminds me of, I, I call them power words. And I, it reminds me of the time when Jesus was in the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane and the, the soldiers had come to arrest him. And I love that because they, uh, he, Jesus confronts the soldiers and Judas Iscariot who came to deceive him and betray him. And uh, he says, well, who are you looking for? <laughs> who are you seeking? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, real tough guys. And listen to this. And Jesus said to them, now this is in, this is in the, the book of John, uh, John 18, and it's uh, verse 5 and 6. And he says this, he says, Jesus says to them, I am he. And Judas, who portrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Come on, somebody. When he, see, because it, it, some, he's, he was more than talking now, he began to speak. And when he spoke, I am he, the power that went out from him, knocked them all down. Judas and all them soldiers went down. Come on, somebody. I, I want you to hear this because it's important. Let's continue with the story at the well, though. Jesus begins to speak of the whitened harvest. Now, at this point, he says the disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? Now listen to what happens here in verse 28. The woman left her water pot. Now I want you to just hold on to that for a minute. That's a pocket nugget. Just hold on to it. The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Come on, this is, a, this is powerful. She left her water pot. Her original purpose, her original plan was to go and get some, some liquid to drink, some water to drink, to nourish herself and possibly some animals. Come on, somebody, or somebody in her family, maybe this guy she was living with. But that was her purpose. But when she found her true purpose in Christ, that water pot became insignificant. It became unimportant. She dropped everything and couldn't wait to run and tell everybody about this man who she just met. Her purpose now was evangelism, to call others to Christ, to bring them in. I can remember when this happened to me and I heard God speak to me when I made him a promise. And I said, God, if you heal me, I'll serve you the rest of my life. And after I got the results of my x-rays, I no longer had cancer. I was cancer free and I couldn't wait to call my wife and tell her. And Cheryl was screaming on the other end of the phone. And I got in my car and I'm driving and it was like a little tape recorder went on in my car and I heard my prayer come back to me and it said, Lord, if you heal me, I'll serve you the rest of my life. And I pulled the car over to the side of the road and I began to weep. Because those words came back and they were powerful. And from that day forward, my wife and I did nothing but plan to take care of whatever business we needed to do. To leave everything behind. Everything that we thought was important. Everything that we thought was our purpose. To, to, to fulfill the purpose that God had for our lives. Can you tell I'm getting a little excited? And when that village heard the truth, the word from the truth, they too were never the same again. Brothers and sisters, I want to I want to make you aware of I, I want to caution you. Beware of religious spirits. Hmm. Uh, you know, in 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 16, Paul is speaking to the people in Corinth, and he, he gives them a he gives them a, a little heads up. And he says, you know, but to this day, whenever Moses, the, uh, whenever Moses, the book of the law is read, a veil of blindness lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns in repentance and faith to the Lord, the veil is taken away. This is powerful, church. The religious spirit will put a veil over you and not allow you to hear or to see the truth. That's the plan of the, that's what a religious spirit will do. Ah, come on. 
But Paul gives instructions to young Timothy on how to deal with those veiled individuals. It's in 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. I want to read it to you from the Passion Translation, if that's okay. And I'm sure it will be, because I'm going to do it anyway. Listen to what the Word of God says. Then with meekness, somebody say meekness. Now you know what meek means? Meek means having the power to punch somebody's lights out and choosing not to do it. That's a rough definition. But then with meekness, you'll be able to carefully enlighten, carefully enlighten those who argue with you so they can see God's gracious gift of repentance and be brought to the truth. And here's why this is important. This will cause them to rediscover themselves. It's almost like the light bulb goes on and their eyes are open to the truth. And escape the snare of Satan who caught them in his trap so they would carry out his purposes. I shared this with you not too long ago. That, you know, just like there are people who don't even know that they're being used by God, there are those that also don't even know that they're being used by the enemy. They're being used by the devil. But when the truth comes to them and their eyes are opened and the veil is lifted, they realize, oh my goodness, you were right. I was wrong. And they turn from that and escape the snare of the enemy. Come on, somebody, this is important. You know, unbelievers walk in spiritual darkness, just as at one time we did. You know that scripture that says we once lived in darkness, but God took us from that darkness and brought us into his marvelous light. So don't get frustrated with people who, uh, who argue with you. Show them love and kindness, full of grace. And remember this, that love covers a multitude of sins. So the heavenly boundaries, come on now, the heavenly boundaries for worship is spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. Come on, somebody. Well, lastly, Let's talk about our walk. What does the Bible say about our walk? I want to read you a couple of scriptures, okay? Can we do that? Oh, yeah, thank you. I'm going to do it. Here we go. I'm going to go all the way back to the Old Testament and begin there. In Deuteronomy 8, 6, the Bible says, Observe the commands of the Lord, your God, by walking in his ways and by fearing him. Micah 6, 8 says this, he has made it clear to you, mortal man, what is good and what the Lord is requiring from you. To act with justice, to treasure the Lord's gracious love, and to walk humbly in the company of your God. Let's move to the New Testament. I've got two scriptures there I want to read. First one is Ephesians 2.10. Ephesians 2.10, Paul speaking, he says, For we are his creation. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. <laughs> and lastly, Colossians 1, 9 through 14. This is, this is a home run right here. Colossians 1, 9 through 14. Listen to what it says. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, Come on, somebody. Do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers mm, of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, <coughs> in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. Oh, I want, almost want to shout hallelujah there. Why don't we do that? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Come on, someone. <laughs> I know I'm getting a little Pentecostal. We're getting closer to Pentecost. I, I'm getting excited. I'm starting to feel it now. 
I, I do. I can get Pentecostal. I can. I can get a little weird. I can get a little strange. I can dance. I can run. Well, I don't know if I can run anymore. I'd like to. Maybe under the power of the Spirit, I can. Yeah. I want to share with you today the secret of walking with God. Are you ready? Good. Here it comes. From the beginning, God has wanted a walking partner. Come on, somebody. From the very beginning, God had a relationship with Adam and Eve that found them walking in the garden in the cool of the day. God created man for the enjoyment of a walking relationship that involved companionship, dialogue, intimacy, joint decision-making, mutual delight, and shared dominion. Jesus went on many kinds, many of these walks with his disciples, and he still likes to walk with us this way today. When the zeal of God captures you, it will ignite you with a great passion to walk with God and to be his friend. I want to read you John 15, 15 from the Passion. Listen to this. I never called you servants because a master doesn't confide in his servants. And servants don't always understand what the master is doing. But I call you my most intimate friends. For I reveal to you everything that I've heard from my father. When God has a friend, guys, come on, divine activity accelerates. We go to a new level. When God has a useful vessel that has been prepared for noble purposes, he will use that vessel. Point to somebody in the room and say, that's you. And if there's nobody there, point to yourself and say, that's me. The secret place is where we develop a walking relationship with God. We must develop a secret history with God before he gives us a public history before people. Somebody ought to say amen. Now, hidden in the secret place, we learn what he's looking for in friends, and we find out what pleases him. Our inner chamber with him becomes our training ground for a life that is rooted and grounded in love. Listen to this quote from Henry Ford. He said, those who walk with God always reach their destination. Come on, that's good. So when we walk with the Lord, we draw closer to the Lord with all of our heart. He becomes our focus. Our hearts long for him. Our hearts seek his presence. Our desire to have fellowship with Christ and be like him will grow while our worldly desires will decrease. And so the heavenly boundaries for our walk are obedience and humility. Come on, somebody. So let's recap the heavenly boundaries that God has, has given to us to use. When it comes to the word, it's all about hearing and doing. When it comes to our worship, it's all about spirit and truth. And when it comes to our walk, it's all about obedience and humility. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you have given us everything we need. Everything we need for life. You have established yourself in us and you work through us. And I, I'm just so grateful for that, Lord. I thank you for your Holy Spirit who reminds us of everything you have taught, who empowers us to do the things you want us to do. Heavenly Father, I know that there are those out there right now that are struggling with battles. They're concerned. They might even be worried. They might even be fearful. Lord, when they turn to you, all their cares turn into joy. All their sorrows turn into laughter. Come on, somebody. Now, maybe you haven't uh, thought about this much, but Jesus is the answer you're looking for. I want to encourage you today. If you don't yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's real simple. It begins with a simple prayer. This is, this, is the, this is the door. This is when you grab the knob, turn it, and open the door. You pray a simple prayer. and You believe in your heart, first of all, that, that Jesus went to the cross for you, just for you. Died for all your sins. That all your sins are covered. He took care of that at the cross. And then, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. On the third day, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit that lives in you, that same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. <laughs> You believe that God raised him from the dead and now he is alive and well seated at the right hand of the Father. 
Your journey begins, and it'll, it's a journey that your life will be changed forever, just like the woman at the well. Come on, somebody. Just like the, the, the people, the men of the city of Samaria, their lives were never the same again. Your life will never be the same. I want to pray right now for everyone. That, that uh, I'm going to just pray a global prayer for this COVID-19, that right now, Lord, let your hand sweep across our globe. Lord, I already know you're doing amazing things. That's why we're seeing the lower numbers. That's why the numbers, my wife spoke this today, it touched my heart and I, and I knew it was a revelatory word, it was a rhema word. She said, you know, everybody's complaining about uh, the, uh, the overreach, everybody's complaining about the miscalculations uh, and she had a revelation, she said, what if because we all actually stopped and prayed that we actually moved the hand of God and it was him that kept it from being any worse. You know what? That's where I'm going from now on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for hearing our prayers and doing it. That's why I'm excited about Pentecost. This is just the beginning. Something big is coming, and I want you to be a part of it with me. So until we see each other again, I pray that you would have uh, health, hope, prosperity, that you would have love, that God will meet every one of your needs uh, according to his riches and glory, because he is able. So until I see each other again, God bless you, I love you, and uh, I'll see you real soon. God bless. Bye-bye.